with this book, I'm trying to hit people who love AA and would like to learn more about William James, who was so foundational in founding AA, and those who can't stand AA, but still could maybe benefit from an understanding of a higher power can be something within you already. And it is what enables you to do something rather than doing something to you. Welcome to Emotional Sobriety. Welcome to Emotional Sobriety. We have a guest today, uh, Dr. Peg O'Connor, and uh, I think we should begin the episode by her making her introduction and letting us know a little bit about what she does. Well, thank you, Patrick, Tom, and Alan for having me Mm -hmm. here. My name is Peg O'Connor, and I am a philosopher, and I'm a recovering alcoholic, and those two are deeply intertwined for me. (laughs) And the work I've been doing uh, in the last about dozen years or so is taking some of the incredible wealth of concepts from Western philosophy in particular, and using it to make sense of suffering in general. But in particular, Peg, let, me, let me say this before you get going, yeah. because after 12 beers, I used to think I was a philosopher. But I think you're the real deal, aren't you? Huh? Well, mm-hmm. I don't know. I was as philosophical when I was a drunk 16 year, years old as, as I am now. But here's one thing I'll say. I have found people struggling with addiction or in recovery or both to be some of the most philosophical people I know. And they're asking the same kind of important questions and having the same kinds of profound insights that, you know, I have seen and heard at pointy headed academic conferences. Mm, So, you know, one of my goals is to make philosophy more accessible to people because it has so much to offer when it's practiced well. And philosophy is an activity. It's not a body of knowledge. It's an activity. It's a way of being in the world. It's a a practice. See, we, 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 we can't repeat the word practice often enough on, on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, it's so, it's so, so true. And, and, you know, one of, one of my favorite philosophers is a guy named Bindle Wilson, who died a few years ago. It was a friend of mine. I don't think he, he he was so, he never published anything, but, but, Mm -hmm. but he was a philosopher. Because like you said, it's, a, it's, it's how he thought and it's how he practiced. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's about how do we make meaning of our lives? What is knowledge? What is self-knowledge? All the kind of moral dimensions. So my training is actually in moral philosophy. So that's how I approach a lot of these things. So I love talking about character. I love talking about responsibilities. I love talking about virtues. And people in recovery love talking about those things too. And so, you know, for me to be able to say, well, look, here is this one philosopher, David Hume, and he's got this amazing chart of of virtues that are pleasant and useful to self and others. And to, you know, talk to people about, well, if you had to have, if somebody were writing your virtue profile, you know, if they could only pick, you know, 10 or 12 um, virtues, what might they pick for you and what would you pick for yourself? Because it's always interesting to see ourselves through the eyes of others, um, because we can learn so much about ourselves when we understand how others see and experience us. Well, it's also very good to be able to ask them for that instead, because otherwise we're just going to make up what what we think they think of us. And then we're going to base our self-esteem on that. It's like, it's like, I'm going to make, oh, I know what you think of me, Peg. It's like, no, I don't. If I want to know, I need to ask. And it's, and it's like, that's a great example of the practice with with Hume's virtues. It's Mm -hmm. like the idea of, no, let's, let's, let's use, let's make use of this tool. I love that. You know, one question I'd like to get to today, given that you're a moral philosopher, on Thursday nights, we have this Thursday night emotional sobriety workshop meeting. What we're doing now is we're going back through the 12 steps and we're looking at the steps from through the lens of uh, self-esteem and how the steps help, you know, help us develop a real authentic self-esteem that's based on humility, right? What we could call a real true self-esteem, right? And how that relates to emotional sobriety, right? That, And we're on step four. And it's very interesting in the use of a searching and fearless moral inventory. And at some point, we can even do it now if you want. But I mean, I want you to get into all the other stuff we were talking about before the show. But but wh- wh- how do you see that? What was Bill getting at when he was talking about it that way? I think he's getting at identifying what is your character. So in moral philosophy, if we're going to talk about virtue ethics, so coming from Aristotle and through Hume that I just mentioned, sort of the most important thing about a person, who a person is, is their moral character. 
and their moral character comprises all of the virtues that they're capable of practicing. And one of the fantastic things that, that Aristotle recognized early on is that we are fundamentally social creatures, we're social animals, and that we come to have particular virtues only by practicing them and oftentimes practicing them in the company of others. So Aristotle was very concerned. In effect, he says, who you are is a matter of what you do habitually and repeatedly to either very good effect to become morally virtuous or to very bad effect. And that Aristotle was worried that people who continue to do bad, bad acts are untrustworthy or unreliable, that they lie, that they're greedy, that what you do becomes who you are. Yeah, and, you know, he's, he's worried. I mean, Aristotle talks about moral viciousness. And so when I get going with my students in, in a class, for example, I might say, do you all agree there's a difference between someone who cheats and a cheater? And they'll say, oh, yeah, there is. But trying to find where that line is is really interesting. But, mm-hmm. you know, that, that moral character, it is your most prized, privileged not possession because it is you, but it's the thing that you should tend the most carefully. And so, you know, with that step of making a fearless and searching moral inventory, I always worry that too many people take it as a, I've got to fill out my ledger book of all of my defects of characters yes. because, mm-hmm. you know, those may be removed later on. And a complete and thorough moral inventory has to include the good, the virtues, maybe with the vices. Because if you can't have an accurate represent, representation of both of those, for me, I always worry about you just get stuck in the negative. Oh, my God, I'm a liar. I cheated. I left my kids. I you know, lost my job, all these things. So the virtues give us something to which we can aspire. But a lot of us you know, in our active addictions have a very hard time, I would like to say, doing an honest moral inventory with the honesty Mm -hmm. attached to including virtues yeah oh absolutely does that make sense oh yeah it makes a lot of sense and see that Mm -hmm. i think one of the challenges is that that we become so harsh with what we see about ourselves and so that shame that we're not functioning the way we should and see this is an interesting thing that you know that i guess we could spend a few minutes talking about See, the difference between what's real and what you think you should be doing. And it's a very interesting thing because sometimes I see people judging themselves for things that are actually not things to judge themselves. It's like it's backwards. They've got it backwards, right? Where where they thought maybe an act was selfish when they were trying to advocate for themselves, but they threw everything into the selfish basket, let's say, or, you know, something else where, where they were in a certain amount of pain, and they were getting angry about it and talking about it. Well, the anger in itself is not a bad thing. But if you think of yourself as an angry person, right, that becomes then an identification rather than what's underneath that is that your Mm -hmm. anger doesn't make you a bad person, it makes you a human being. We need to figure out what was going on, what what unenforceable rule got violated, or what was your right. demand, or mm-hmm. whatever. And so it, you know, the and it's so interesting. You talk about Aristotle. First thought I had is like, my God, he was a relationally oriented therapist. <laughs> I mean, he really yes. was talking about yes. relation. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he 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 was. And and I think part of the problem is so you know why to go back to my earlier example of liking to have. Hume's rich, long list of virtues is that our, there's been an incredible reduction or shrinkage in the kinds of moral terms that we use, good or bad, right or wrong. Yes. And those are really blunt yes. categories. And everybody thinks they've got to slot their actions into one of three or four categories. And things that don't fit, well, they don't know what to do with, but they end up filling up these categories, not seeing that there are four categories. There's 140 categories. Wow. And so, right. you know, when you get people better able to identify moral traits or moral defects, it gives them so much more to work with. And I think it's an important part 
I think too, one of the great things in recovery of the best sort is that people learn how to, you know, you say self-esteem, I say, um, barring a phrase from Epictetus, coming to belong to themselves, Ooh, you know, knowing how to belong to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mont- Epictetus and Montaigne, knowing how to belong to yourself. Oh, that's wonderful. And write- in addiction, we belong to our substances or we belong to the opinions of others. We belong to any or everything other than ourselves, because we don't know who and what we are. We don't know what we stand for. Right. You don't know what you stand for. You can't stand. Right. And I don't, that's a great line. If life is a test at all, it's an essay test, not a short answer test, you know? And so we're at, we're, these things need to be essays. These things need to be inclusive and not exclusive, you know, mm-hmm. or as you described too, in your pres- the presentation, I just listened to on, on, on uh, YouTube is expansive, not, con- you know, c- because expansion is growth expansion, you know, growth, yes. growth always comes from the inside out. You know, you know, you, you can't imagine a ripple effect that, that comes from the outside in you can't imagine a a tree growing from the outside in it's like it always comes out but alan what i wanted to say is one of the things that that, uh uh, peg is saying that really fits into something you and i've been talking about is kind of our our commitment recently to say that self the the term self-criticism this is semantics but it matters because we use semantics to figure this stuff out so the the term self-criticism has gotten has gotten all tangled up with self-condemnation and and so that we so that now we, we we're so hesitant to say self-critical, but in truth is everything we're talking about, if we're talking about inventories, is self-critical. We need to be able to have healthy self-critique to be able to do that. And that's what you're talking about. We and you're and you're absolutely right, Peg. That in my I'm talking about my clients in therapy. It's like the, what's the hardest thing? It's not hard to, for them to acknowledge and to own negative aspects of themselves. It's hard for them to acknowledge the wonderful things, the good things mm-hmm. about themselves. Not that they're, they're aspiring to, but the things that are already part of who they are. They- oh, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that that's one of the most important things that, you know, those of us who are in mutual help groups for sobriety, whether it is AA, whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, smart recovery, that we provide mirrors to each other. And sometimes it's really important to hear others say, well, you know, GPEG, when you first came in here, you couldn't do anything. And now, you know, you're paying your bills, you're suiting up, you have been a really good friend to so-and-so. And And it is virtually impossible for so many of us to have that count as data. Because I think to go back to something Alan said, you know, we've already got the confirmation bias going because, well, we already know that we're, you know, total losers and, Right. You know, if you if you think if you think, failures. Yeah. if you think if you think something positive about me, you've lost some credibility. I'm going to wonder about your judgment. Yeah. Because, yeah you gotta- or I'm going to think, <laughs> oh, I, I, I duped you too, you big dumb dumb. That's um, right. But wow. I think a lot of that goes back to introspection. The idea mm-hmm. that each person can know him, her or themselves because we've got the best perspective on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this goes back to you know, Rene Descartes in the 1600s saying that the contents of my mind are completely open and transparent to me. It's like I've got a big, huge flashlight of reason that I can shine around and there are no hidden corners. There are, there are no cobwebs. I can see everything. And I think I this was certainly true for me. I'll only use I statements here. I peg. I peg was certainly guilty of thinking because I have this privileged access to the contents of my own mind or my soul or however you want to say it that I know myself better than anyone else could ever possibly. So while you, Tom, might see some good things in me, I know the real me that you don't have access to. And we become, oh gosh, what? I don't want to say enslaved, but we become beholden to that view about ourselves because- Well, defensive, you become defensive. It felt dangerous to let that in. We're afraid of, if I let something positive in, that it's going to be, it's going to become a great disappointment for me when I find out it's not true. I think I want to push back on that one a little bit. Okay. Though. I mean, I, th- I think there are some people, so I'm thinking about people who have been subject to a kind of global shame about whether it is their race, whether it is about their sex or sexual orientation, whether it's about their religious background, the way that 
oppression works, the ways in which we internalize all kinds of beliefs about ourselves, that I am just a fill in the blank. And oftentimes Mm -hmm. it is a marginalized or disempowered kind of identity. And I think that that many people who have been so socialized, who have so internalized stereotypes about them, believe that someone like me, I just am a blank, so can't even imagine or hope for being okay. something else, that someone like me could ever be successful because people like me, and, and I hear this from, you know, first generation college students, for example, they'll say, you know, I'm just a first generation, you know, I'm in school with these parents, their grandparents went here, their great, great parents, you know, I'm just a first gen student and, and they can't imagine the success. So it's not that they're fearful of it. They can't even imagine it. You know, so they don't, they don't that, even see the pot. They don't even imagine. They, they don't can't even see the possibility. See the possibility yeah. yet. Got it. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that's different in kind. Yeah, I think you're right. I like that. No, it's, 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 I love how you bring in the bigger picture, right? Sometimes that we forget about, you know, I remember those doll studies when they were going to do the, uh, you know, talk about the issue of desegregating the schools, right? Mm-hmm. And they sent these two black, and in fact, a Harvard psychologist uh, with one of his students, they went down to the South and they devised a test to look at the self-esteem and how a uh, child's self-esteem has been, you know, impacted by these, the cultural, you know, biases that we have, right? The racism. You remember, it was a great study. All they, they did is they put down two dolls in front of the Two child. dolls. Two dolls. And look at the doll. effect of those two dolls. Yeah, two a white doll, yeah. and I think it was a brown doll. I don't think yep. it was a black. It was a brown doll. I think they, it was like a dark brown, you know, dark brown doll. And they said, "Who would you like to play with?" They picked up the white doll. Who's Every the time. good doll? The white doll. I mean, I get goosebumps on on how tragic that is in terms of the how that racism got internalized, right? In terms of that, I am a bad person. I, mean, I, do, I am this way just because I am that's a person right. of this color, oh a person of this ethnicity. That's right. Because, I, so that has all the explanatory power. And it's like, no, 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 it's not explanatory power. It's power for sure. But mm. yeah, no, yes. that was phenomenal stuff. You, you know, one of the things I was talking about when you're talking about how um, we have these basic categories that we throw ourselves into, I'm good or I'm bad, or I'm right or I'm wrong. And that we lose the the spectrum of possibilities, right? Are you familiar with Bowen's work at all with differentiation? Not too much. So okay. this is the philosopher in me saying I don't know. So well, much that's about wonderful. psychology. Yeah. Philosophers do that. Psychologists say, "I'll oh, don't make up some bullshit." No, I'm teasing. <laughs> hey, but don't forget, psychology spun off philosophy only about you know oh, four well, years ago. Was the We're cousins. When I when I took, uh, you know, two of my favorite classes as an undergraduate were history and systems. And they were part one and part two of the history and systems of psychology. And the whole part one was about philosophers and how that was the beginning of psychology. I mean, so many things. But but what Bowen observed was he said that that he believed our development could be understood at a very basic cellular level mm-hmm. and that it really paralleled how cells develop, right? So cells start out in a very, and I'm not a biologist, so I have a very rudimentary understanding of this. My wife could articulate this much better, but but cells start out in a very undifferentiated state because the DNA has not yet expressed themselves in terms of the genes Mm -hmm. and the cells haven't become specified in terms of their functioning. Some cells never do that. They're called stem cells and that's, there's a lot of excitement about those. But the ones that do, they go through a developmental process and they start to become what they are going to be through this development. If you take that cell early on, let's say it's going to be develop an eye and you move it to a a fetus's cheek, it does an amazing thing. It reads all of the DNA programming of the cells in its microenvironment and it changes its basic nature. Mm. and now grows into a cheek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you move that cell later on, once it's become more specified and differentiated, and a third eye is going to grow here. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't get overly influenced by what's going on around it. And Bowen says, this is what happens with our development. 
if we are in the right environment and he included culture, family, all of that stuff, that that what we will get, it will be encouraged to to differentiate ourselves to be what we can be. And when we do that, we will get to a point in our life where we differentiate things. Like one of these things is we will have a consciousness that looks at 50 categories, not two. Mm -hmm. An yeah. undifferentiated consciousness looks at the world in very black and white ways. This is either good or it's bad. There's nothing in between, right? An undifferentiated consciousness takes everything personally. An undifferentiated yeah. consciousness has a thousand rules for how things are supposed to be for me to be okay. Because right, right. the undifferentiated person is so dependent on their environment to be okay. Mm -hmm. As we grow in recovery, you know, we start to do what you're talking about. You know, in some way we, we start, we reinstate the process of differentiation and we start growing along these lines and can now look at that list of, I'm very interested in this list of virtues. Uh, you know, I've never seen that list and I'd like to see it, you know, but I mean, that's fascinating to me that there's so many possibilities and you can't see that when you're undifferentiated. You, you can't see it in anything that is a possibility is oftentimes a scary possibility, an unwanted possibility. I mean, it I think and that's, it threatens it my threatens. undifferentiated consciousness. Oh, my God. The world is not this way. Oh, no, it's got to be this way. This is the way right. I feel secure. Yeah, and right we, tend to, we tend to, you know, prize security over many other things. Right. Familiar, familiar is perceived as safe. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But we start operating with that as a universal mm. principle. Right. Well, I see. And one of the things we say is that emotional sobriety is operating with a consciousness that's that's a consciousness of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're differentiated, where you're not taking things personally, where you're able to look at, you know, the differences in life and really, really take them in. You know, I was working with somebody the other day about a situation that happened with a person in their life that reminded them very much of an interaction with their father, which was a very abusive thing. And right away, the first reaction was to this new one, because this is kind of what trauma does, right? We take the past and we project it into the present. Mm -hmm. This person's just like my dad. And see, that's the undifferentiated consciousness. And so the piece of work we did was, all right, there are similarities, but there's differences. Mm -hmm. First of all, let's go back and see what you have to say to your father. And we did that. And then we go to now, you know, let's talk about the difference between this person and your dad. And as a person differentiates, they start to change how they're feeling about that person. It's fascinating. Yeah, this is, this is fascinating. Well, and you're coming at it as a psychologist. I come at it as a moral philosopher. So there's a, a wonderful expression of moral philosophy from Annette Beyer called the essential arts of personhood, which is just such a lovely mm -hmm. expression. And not that that's a, you know, a, a set number of skills, but that there are some skills like hoping and imagining and all the mental faculties about deliberating and differentiating would be in there. And I think that many people never develop that kind of art of differentiating, which for me, the moral philosopher says, what does that do to that person's sense of agency or their autonomy in the world and how they're going to think about responsibilities and thinking about you know, responsibilities don't just run backwards to blame or accountability, but responsibilities are generative and they run forward and in multiple directions. But I think one of the things that, that I certainly have noticed, again, I'll just use my I statements here, as someone who developed an addiction early as a teenager, I really never got it right about what was properly in my scope of responsibility and what belonged to other people. And I would just be taking, oh, that's my fault. It's my fault that it's raining. Well, the great, glorious, powerful peg. Who knew I had that power? But I assumed that it was my responsibility. And then the other thing I would do all the time, and I think this is an essential art of personhood that I'm still learning how to master, is when and how to apologize appropriately. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a piece about myself called the knee-jerk apologist. You know, I'll apologize mm -hmm. for everything. Oh, you, Tom, who I've just met are having a bad day. I'm sorry. And I'll somehow not just say that I'm sorry as a verbal gesture. 
I really right. think it's somehow my fault, A, and B, I should do something to redress it. And, and I think a lot of people struggling with addiction have too much of an expanded sense of what is their responsibility and what's mm-hmm. not. You can say, well, if more of us were better with the serenity prayer, if more of us were better at understanding what's in our control and what's outside of our control, that would be a huge um, release of pressure. You know, right. well, open up all we got to do is to, to, to test that. All you do is, 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 is confront somebody about the fact that they apologize too much. What are they going to do? They apologize, they apologize. Re- reflexively. They can't, they don't, they don't even have time to stop it. I'm so sorry yeah. that I do that, but I want to go back to, cause one of the things you, 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 I believe this is, you have written about and talked about a lot is, is about William James is, is fits into this, this, and that is how important free will is. To, to, yes. to James's work. I mean, it certainly fits into what we're talking about. It's like, you know, not only how, how important it is, but what it is. Yeah. And so some philosophers say free, the question of free will is one of the biggest boondoggle in all of Western philosophy. And others say, well, it's part of what it means to be a human being. So free will is taken to be kind of a general feature of human beings, that we have the capacity to make choices, we have the capacity to take information and then choose to act going down path A, path B, path C. The idea is that it's opposed to determinism, that there's something like fate or that the universe operates in a law-like way with regards to everything. And so free will would be illusory then. So sort of the, the opposite of free will is determinism. And so William James is as a young man. So he's in his, he would have been in his early thirties at the time. And he struggled with what he would call severe acute melancholia almost his entire life. And he was at the point of contemplating suicide. He was working at, well, the term of the time, an insane asylum. And he saw a patient there who was just rocking methodically just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he recognized himself in that patient. He said, that shape I am. And seriously contemplating suicide, that suicide seemed to be a very viable option for him. And he said, though, I realized that I had to believe in my free will. I had to move away from all these abstractions and think about the fact that I can choose to act in certain ways. I can go to the left, I can go to the right, that I have to, he said, my first act of faith was believing in free will. That's what I had to do. And his coming to have a belief in free will, that belief helped to author his conversion out of that severe melancholia. Now he'll kind of relapse into it later on and he dances around the edge at time. But he said that his first, his first, act of free will was to believe in free will. That and is, that's, that's really profound that. when you think mm-hmm. about it, that mm-hmm. you've got to say what I do does matter. But yes. that is a kind of what James would say. It's a kind of faith. You're willing to act when the results aren't certified or guaranteed in advance, but you got to act. You got to do something. You got to go to the left. You got to go to the right. So, you know, free will, nothing was more disheartening or upsetting to James as a kind of determinism where what we did wouldn't make any difference at all because then the world would have no meaning or value. Anything I in particular did would have no meaning or value. Anything you did, anything that anyone did, um, it would just be this kind of lockstep progression. And that would have been devastating for him. Yeah, yes. Yeah, my 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 friend I, I, I called the philosopher Bindel, he said, I said a simple statement. I remember really, we talked about it for, for probably hours afterwards, but he said, but you know, beliefs are choices, you know, and, 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 and the point he was making for one thing was when we were talking about fundamentalism and of different fundamentalist kinds of things is, is that you don't have to, you don't have, to, you have no responsibility to prove, you know, any objective reality to what you choose to believe you, you know, it's, it's, it's your choice. you get to choose it. It's like mm-hmm. you don't have to convince others that you're right. It's, yeah, it's, that's, it's, that's, it's personal. It is. And William James wrote this wonderful piece called The Will to Believe. And it's around the same time he wrote a piece called Is Life Worth Living? 
And so James was the physician, he was a psychologist, he was a philosopher, and he knew that there was a real antipathy towards religious faith, towards spiritual beliefs, that, mm-hmm. you know, spiritual faith, spiritual beliefs, we might say now, would belong on the island of misfit toys, that, mm-hmm. you know, faith is belief where your reason runs out. And James says, everyone has the right to believe where the evidence runs out, particularly when that belief may help to bring about the thing believed. So James kind of flips it and says, faith can make fact. And the example he uses in life is life worth living. He says, imagine you're out hiking and you're stuck and you've got to move one way or the other. And if you believe you can make the jump or you can turn left instead of turn right, that'll help you to do it. Where you doubt, you will drag your toe and probably, you know, fall and not make the kind of leap. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. faith and fact are related in a way that, you know, many people slam James for saying that. But mm-hmm. to me, and as a person in recovery, my faith that I can change my life, that I can be in the world in different ways, helps to bring about the fact that I now am in the world in different kinds of ways. And James says, there's nothing weird about faith. We have faith in all kinds of things. I have faith that when the plumber comes for my broken pipe, that he will fix it. And if I didn't have faith that someone could fix my broken pipe, my pipe would remain unbroken. So, and science traffics in faith as much as anyone. I mean, they posited the God particle decades ago, and then it was only when they got the collider that was powerful enough to prove it. But that's faith. And that faith is no different in kind from people who have spiritual beliefs. Everyone has a right to believe. It's powerful. Yes. Well, I I think you're um, referring to some of it indirectly, but when you were in early recovery, uh, what was the dimension that you felt was missing that now you try to impart to your students and, you know, bring forward, I suppose? Um, yeah, that that's that's a great question. So, you know, I tried sobering up when I was in college and I couldn't do it. You know, back to the environmental piece. It just was not going to happen. And I would, you know, quit drinking. I was I was an athlete. I wouldn't drink during season. And then that was proof that I didn't have a problem, that I started drinking again. That was never the proof that I had a problem. Right. I could only prove that I didn't have a problem. Mm-hmm. And sort of how I think about it now, and I certainly have had students who are struggling with their drug and alcohol use and who have been in treatment or are in recovery, And I think I'm going to go back to something, you know, that Alan was talking about earlier, the importance of the context of the space of being available to students. I mean, I'm very out about my recovery, you know, to, to in some ways demystify it in a kind of way. And the same way I'm, I'm out of my school, you know, I'm out as a queer. It's just, this is a fact of the matter about me. And one of the, biggest things that I say to my students now, and and it's really, this is a lesson I have to learn about every 27 days, um, that limitations can be liberating. Oftentimes we think that limitations take away our freedom of mobility. And the example I use is that I still play a fair amount of competitive tennis, but I have a 57 year old rotator cuff. I can no longer serve like I can serve and I've lost a step, but it's liberating no longer trying to do those things. And instead say, I accept this limitation and I'm going to develop different parts of my game. And I've become an entirely different player. I'm a better player now at 57 than I was at 19. And to say that accepting limitations, and I kind of regard addiction as a limiting condition, that I found freedom in that. And so, you know, but it's tough when you're really, really young. You think any limitations means taking something away. And I say, no, accepting limitations means getting so much more. There's more room there because you stop caring about certain things. You stop worrying about, you know, can I do these things? I can't do these things, but I can do all these other things over here. The obstacle is the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, that's what you played in college tennis? Peg? I played tennis and squash. Yeah. Wow. Give me a racket and I'm happy. It's like just yeah, an really, my huh? hand at this point. That's yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah, the racket straining machines right there. Oh, look there at go. that. Go. Oh, I had one of the I'm an avid tennis player myself. Um, I just love the game. I got certified as a sports psychologist about 20 years ago. And oh yeah. You know, I, I do some work with uh 
with I've worked with some professional tennis players, a lot of upcoming juniors and and just I came in. I just did an hour and a half workout this morning. Oh, a drill, a drill okay. session. I, I just had it. But, I, you know, I find the same thing. I am playing. I, I am not physically. I'm not. I'm 70 years old now. I'm not the player I was when I was 40 years old, but I'm a better player. Yep. I'm a smarter player. I read the court more. I'm more strategic. I used all the angles in the court instead yep. of just hitting the ball and keeping it in play. I mean, it, things have changed tremendously in my game. It's oh, yeah. So much fun. It, it's so much fun. It's a, Well, and I regularly play doubles with someone who's 92 and was the 85 and over national doubles champion. And I'm still learning from him. Oh, that's wonderful. See, I love oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yep. I love that. Yep, he he can't hit it as hard as anyone else, but damn, if he doesn't have those angles, like that's unnatural. Arr. So I'm always on his team, so that helps. Helps me. <laughs> helps me. That is. Well, listen, that that's part of of this whole story that we're talking about is that we are always evolving, aren't we? That we're yeah, changing. or as, yeah, as William James says, we're always selving. Don't think that you have a self. But you're always selfing. It's always so, a process. It's love, always love your that. material, social, and spiritual, intellectual dimensions of you. It's all the same stuff, but you're constantly selfing. And he Ooh. says, you know, you've got as many social selves as people who recognize you. Your spiritual self is the, it's the, the seat of your interest and your effort. And your material self includes your body, includes your clothes, includes your family. And so you know, that we are all these things and we're selfing. Why should we ever think that, oh, now finally I'm who I'm meant to be, or, you know, now I've really, I found my true self. I mean, all that language of true self, James is going to say, uh-uh, I don't know. I want to throw out a quote by Rollo May. I want to hear your reaction to it and what you think about it. Um, and then I'll share with you some of my thoughts about it. Rollo May says, um, freedom He's talking about free will, I believe. He goes, freedom is not the opposite of determinism. But it is the experience one happens when one realizes that their behavior is being determined by these forces that are outside of their awareness. I'm going to go back to what Patrick said earlier. We'd like to have a yes and approach to things. So one <laughs> yes <laughs> My yes and approach to that is, mm -hmm. yes, much of what goes into our judgments and our decisions to act in a certain way are certainly from external considerations, external constraints. And there's freedom in recognizing the ways in which certain things are constrained. But I think there's also an element of freedom that, that is beyond that. Well, it, it's you see, there's an interesting theory in Gestalt. I'm a Gestalt therapist, right? Okay. That was yep. trained as a Gestalt therapist. So, it, you know, the heart of Gestalt therapy, first of all, is an incredible faith in the human spirit, right? I mean, yes, I think that it's it was the third force in psychology was so, in, to my opinion, so refreshing because it really saw us as not as pathological, right? Not as having original sin, but as having mm -hmm. unbelievable possibilities. I mean, an incredible rate. The paradoxical theory of change in Gestalt therapy, which is what happens, I think, when we take step one. Because in step one, when I say I am powerless over alcohol, I am actually saying I'm being determined by these forces that are being lived within me that I haven't really accepted and wanted to accept because I wanted to think of myself as as having the power to choose whether I drink or not. But the minute we own that we're powerless, and this is what we say is the paradoxical theory of change, the minute one owns it, now free will is available. Mm -hmm. If I say I'm powerless, now I have the possibility of discovering a different power. Of, of, yep. I can, I can, I can see that. You see how that, you see how that, it's a very interesting, because look, you know, if, if I'm working with someone, I mean, how does a liar become honest? By first admitting they're a liar. They got to own it, own what they're saying. And that's what the paradox, mm -hmm. the paradoxical theory of change says is, as soon as I own what I'm doing and I own the truth of what is happening, then a new possibility exists instead of trying to be someone I'm not. 
I certainly agree with that. And I think that's why, to go back to James, I mean, his definition of faith really is about believing in maybes and possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't believe in any other possibility, yeah. then yes, you are, you are truly stuck. You, you believe yourself to have no agency or control in anything that you do. Yeah. But as soon well, as you're able to see, count Maybe that's what happened to him when he saw himself as the person sitting there rocking, is that at that moment, he owned who he was. I, th- I think so. And I love so much about William James. And one of the things I love about him, and he kind of does it in the same spirit of, so here's the intellectual kind of genealogy of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who read Montaigne, who read Epictetus. So the connection there with Montaigne, so uh, uh, writing in the mid 1500s in France, the inventor of the essay form, who says, my primary object of study is me. And I believe that if a person can come to know everything about you know, himself, they will learn a lot about humanity in that same kind of way. And Montaigne also says it's our great duty to compose our character, not to compose great books, not to compose, mm-hmm. you know, other kinds of artworks, compose not to compose our war. character. That's it's cool. to compose yourself. And and William James has that same kind of self-knowledge that is totally imbued with humility in a kind of way. That William James has a certain kind of humility. Could he be a pill of an academic? Of course he could. That's what academics do. We can be pillish at times. But I think he's got a genuine humility and sort of understanding who and how he is in the world and that it could be radically different because he had two younger brothers whose lives did not go well at all. Yeah, you know, his younger really- one of his younger brother younger brothers um, died early because of war injuries from the Civil War. And his other younger brother, Bob, was just a raging alcoholic his entire life who would spend years in asylums for the inebriate and then get out for a while and then go back in. So I think William James always knew that his life could have been very, very different if he had made some different choices. And that it was important for him to, I think, always keep the possibilities. He had his test cases you know, right near him of, of how his life could be different. Good, good he was point. also the older brother of, of Henry James, the great novelist who suffered yeah. in the same kinds of ways as William James with the neurasthenia, mm-hmm. bad health, yeah. nervous disposition. I mean, it was a family affliction. Yeah. Boy, something was going on in that family, though, to produce a Henry James and a, and a William James. <laughs> I mean, my uh, a Henry James, a William James. Garth and, and Bob, who were the ones that the father regarded not as intellectually gifted and talented, so he was fine with those two going off to the Civil War. And then there's a younger sister, Alice, who in her own right is a well-known diarist. Um, she died very young. I don't think she made it to 40 with breast cancer. But she hated her old, older brother, Bob, the raging alcoholic, that when Bob announced he was moving back to the Cambridge area, she picked up and moved across the pond to go live with her brother, Henry. She wasn't going to have anything to do with that kind of madness. She hated the guy because he created such chaos. Oh, yeah. The alcoholic family, right? Here it is. I mean, alcoholism yep. in the family. I mean. Yeah. Writ large and with 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 genius behind it. I mean, I know there's all kinds of links between you know genius and certain mental illnesses. But, you know, that diagnosis of neurasthenia, you don't see that anymore. But, yeah, no, you, you know, don't. You don't, you don't hear those terms. Who was the physician, George Beard, who said, oh, yes, it's it's mostly reserved for the literate classes. You're like, yeah, <laughs> you couldn't have neurasthenia and be working in a mine, for example. Wouldn't mm-hmm. have been tolerated. <laughs> well, I'm look sorry, at, you, you can't you, have this. Taking you off on this direction is, uh, uh, you know, look at is tell us about your book. Tell us about your book and, and what you've done. So uh, this book that that you've maybe seen is called Higher and Friendly Powers, Transforming Addiction and Suffering. And um, it's an itch that I wanted to scratch for about 20 years because I went to my first AA meeting as a sophomore in college. And as soon as I heard the language of God as higher power, I pretty much you know ran out like my pants were on fire. Mm-hmm. And uh, I stayed away from AA for the first 20 years of my sobriety. 
But I always thought that there was a lot for AA to offer, but I couldn't square myself with that notion of a providential God as a higher power who's going to remove my defects of character, do things for me. And, and my job was to sit down and shut up and, you know, let, let God drive my life. So I had read a couple of references where Bill Wilson referred to William James as a co-founder of AA, and I wanted to figure out what that meant. And I did figure out what it meant, that Bill Wilson had his sobering up experience in the town's hospital in 1934. And he said he felt as if a gust of wind that was spirit came through and removed his desire to drink and that he had a conversion process. And I learned that Bill had read William James's great work, The Varieties of Religious Experience. So it never sat right with me, though, of how higher power could be reduced to just a Christian notion of God, knowing what I know about James as a philosopher, that he was a pluralist and that yes. he was an American pragmatist. I thought, how would all of this be reduced? So I threw myself into the varieties of religious experience, which you know was this massive set of lectures that James gave in yes. 1902 uh, that was published the same year. And realized that William James talked about higher and friendly powers as being anything that enables a person to expand beyond their own convulsed little embattled self, to use you know, language oh, from him. Oh, and nice. that moral, moral principles, ideals, a faith in humanity, a belief that you could be a better person, all of them could function as higher power. He says, really, the only thing you need is just something larger. Anything larger will do if it'll help you take the next step. So William James is a remarkable companion to people who are suffering acutely because he knew his own suffering. So he's got this great category called world sickness of the divided self. And he talks about what happens to people who come to have no optimism. They land at this worst kind of pathological melancholy which is where he landed when he saw the other young man in the insane asylum. And so he's just an, a remarkable tour guide of yes. wow. melancholy and depression and loss and angst and anxiety and using anxiety in its more original philosophical term, not as a medical diagnosis, but anxiety was a spiritual condition in which Kierkegaard, the philosopher said, a person is fundamentally out of balance between what is possible and what is impossible or what's possible and what's necessary and what's finite or what's infinite. And William James is the one who talked about conversions, different types of conversions. How does someone change their habitual center of personal energy? How does somebody go from having alcohol or one of the examples he uses in varieties, which is all first person stories of people who have profound religious experiences like Bill Wilson had. And one of the examples is this fellow who goes on to become a Christian minister who says, I'm struggling with carnal mirth, what we might now call sex addiction. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the other stories in there were stories that would have resonated with Bill Wilson, guys who had been losing everything, who couldn't sober up, but somehow they were able to change. And Bill, Bill Wilson took much from William James and got it right. So the nine step promises, for example, very much echo mm -hmm. what William James talks about as the fruits of the spiritual tree when someone undergoes a conversion and changes their habitual center of personal energy or their hot spot of their consciousness. He got that absolutely right. I wanted to write something that would expand that notion of higher power and return it to its far more expansive and inclusive mm, um, conception than what Bill W. reduced it to. Because I think AA is wonderful and there is so much there. But if you come in with a different set of spiritual beliefs, if you're spiritual but not religious, if you don't come from a, a background of some kind of providential God, I know for me, I felt like I was lying. I was being dishonest. And then for every meeting where you would read how it works, like, wait a minute, constitutionally incapable. I'm not being dishonest, but this doesn't fit me. 
So with this book, I'm trying to hit people who love AA and would like to learn more about William James, who was so foundational in founding AA, and those who can't stand AA, but still could maybe benefit from an understanding of a higher power can be something within you already. And it is what enables you to do something rather than doing something to yeah. you. Oh, I, I love that, Peg. It's, a, it's so close to my experience that you're describing because, mm-hmm. you know, what I feel happened to me is um, I really was able to tap into this incredible, powerful, Fritz Perl called it an organismic wisdom. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really what, what Maslow called self-actualization, mm-hmm. that there's this force within us that grows us to be to, towards wholeness right? We're always moving towards this wholeness in whatever way. The way Rollo May said, it says, you know, don't think of pathology as, as a sickness, but as the best possibility that a person can discover at that moment to ensure their existence. Hmm. And I love that, right? Is that we're always looking within the possibilities I have, how can I make the most sense of them? You know, Mm -hmm. and this was the, you know, that's an incredible force that we tend to actualize whatever is possible. But what AA does did for me was to enlarge that possibility, Mm -hmm. just the way you're talking about it. And that's that's my I call it my my higher power is the force in Star Wars. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's what I embrace. It's like there's this this energy that's an incredible energy in in the world, in the universe. I can see it all around me. And I got so alienated or thought I was alienated from it. And and today it's like it's getting more and more integrated or I might able to honor it more. But I love the way you're talking about this. I think it's it's fascinating. It's so good to have you here, Peg. Oh, it's, it's been great, Bing. I just, I so appreciate these conversations. Oh, we, and I'm, we, I'm Yeah, just, well, we're going to, can, if, if you're open to it, let's do it again and again and again and again. I, I would, I would, I would happily do it because I just love knowing there are people like you in the world working with people who are suffering and making yeah. enormous differences in the world. I mean, I think that's the whole thing that we've got to continue to multiply options for people to be in recovery or be in remission or to fundamentally change, you know, their relationships to alcohol, other drugs and, and certain no, things. And I love this. So spirit. I'm heartened. Yeah. No, good. Mm-hmm. Because I love your spirit is that, you know, you're trying to be inclusive and that's how I think of emotional sobriety. It's uh-huh. really the ideas and principles here, as we've talked about, Tom, they, yeah, it's, well, it's for, making it more accessible. I mean, well, yeah. she talks about through 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 what you're saying, Peg, for uh, and 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 your study of, of William James is is like it's is taking something rather than to contract it to but to expand it to make it more to, to make it more accessible. It's like you know, mm-hmm. it, it's like like I said at that at the outset when we were all first talking, you know, I've I've always thought, you know, what do people do who aren't alcohol alcohol alcoholics or drug addicts? It's like it's nice to know that you know that, no 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 no, it's not just us. It's it's all there's we just have we we just have those things in common in terms of our particular ways of suffering, you know our particular coping mechanisms that you know that yeah. we thought were working fine but weren't, but it's so much broader than that and the, and the more and, and that and the, and this is where I think we all, we all the longer we stay therapists I think we're, we're coming back home to philosophy anyway. They're all capturing the human condition. Like when I read a poet oh, yeah. like Rumi. For example, oh. we're talking about 12th century now, 1100. I know. Right? And the, the way he talks, I mean, mm-hmm. it's like he's sitting with me in my world. Right, hey, right. Oh, well, well and, and talk about Epictetus, the, 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 Sto- the Stoics, the Stoics are emotionally sober people. It's like, it's they, all about emotional sobriety. It's like, it's so exactly. true. I read Marcus Aurelius. It's like, it's like, oh my God, read meditations. It's, it's, so it's like, okay. It's it like, is that's so my true. morning reading. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe that's what you can right. expose us to is the, that philosophy, that all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And we can now enlarge our consciousness about all this mm-hmm. stuff. I love it. Well, Beautiful. yeah. And enlargement. I mean, Tom is absolutely right. I mean, what what William James says about spiritual impulses, he said they're part of human nature as much as anything else. And what they do is they enlarge us and the universe and enable us to reach out beyond our own. Like I said before, embattled little convulsive self. And that's so powerful. 
Goosebumps. Love it. Goosebumps. I know. It's all <laughs> yeah. good. Yay! <laughs> very, very good to know you, Peg. Yay. All right. Well, we'll see you in a few weeks again. I'll have Patrick. Yay, time. sounds good. Great. Thank you all. I was teaching remotely, um, so I'm out in Maine. Okay. Oh, Maine. Beautiful. Oh, my aunt lives in Belfast. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So I'm one peninsula over for on the Blue Hill Peninsula. It's so beautiful. You're in a good place. I'm in a great place. Ooh. Wonderful, right. wonderful discussion. Thank you for your thank time. You, thank you. Thank you. Peace out. Tinge your life. Tinge your myth. Cultivate your narrative with whomever you're with. Then with glass in hand and children on one knee. Bring some stories. Bring your stories back to me. It ain't a crime to be a human. Never be ashamed to be yourself. Rest assured that whatever you're doing will entertain me like nobody else. So here's to us, my old friends. Until it's time to drink the wine and break the bread again. With glass in hand and children on one knee. Bring some stories, bring your stories back to me.